With so many great characters in the Umbrella Academy, I really could have made this video about almost any of them. However, considering that the reason I started watching the show in the first place was because of Klaus's actor Robert Sheehan, it was inevitable that this video would be about Klaus. With Season 3 developing Klaus as a character even further, he has cemented himself in my mind as the best character in the show. In this video, I will look at what makes Klaus such a compelling character and how he has evolved over the course of the series. To understand the Klaus that we meet at the beginning of the show, I think we should first delve into his childhood. Klaus was born on October 1st, 1989, in an Amish community to a woman named Rachel Hirschberger. Two days later, he was sold to Reginald Hargreaves for a sum of $3,000. It was later discovered that he could commune with the dead and was raised to be a member of the Umbrella Academy. Klaus's childhood was filled with trauma that would have a profound impact on him for the rest of his life. Reginald was not much in the way of a father figure. He did not treat them as children, but as a means to his ultimate end of getting his wife back. He tried to turn the kids into a superhero team so that they would be able to defeat the Guardians in Oblivion, before he would then sacrifice them to get the marigold particles that resided in their bodies. Reginald remained distant and unloving, pushing the children in ways that would be considered abuse. Reginald Hargreaves never taught these people to be people. He mm -hmm. didn't teach them how to be emotionally stable. So like, they end up doing huge damage to their, to their supposedly normal lives. In Klaus's particular case, Reginald took a sink or swim approach as he locked the young child in a mausoleum for hours, exposing him to the dead spirits in the area. Klaus's power in itself can be traumatic, especially for a child. The spirits that Klaus encounters are very forthcoming to him with how they died, which only serves to terrify him. For the spirits, Klaus is their only way of communicating with the living world, and so they flock to him like moths to a flame, bombarding him with their unfinished business. The sheer amount of them is overwhelming for Klaus, not to mention the things that they are unloaded onto Klaus are likely very unpleasant and not something a child should be exposed to. Klaus is visibly distressed during these training sessions, begging Reginald to leave and go back home. His pleas fall on deaf ears and he is forced to endure more of this torture alone. The way Reginald tried to develop Klaus's power traumatized him and instilled in him a fear of his own abilities. This stunted the development of his powers as well as his development as a person. This was intentional on Reginald's end, as making Klaus feel small and weak made him easier to control. However, Reginald seemingly overshot the level of trauma that would allow Klaus to rely on him but still develop. The result he actually achieved had Klaus lacking any ability to control his powers or develop them any further. This led Reginald to consider Klaus his greatest disappointment and would lead to more issues for Klaus as an adult. My greatest disappointment, number four. You only scratched the surface of what you were truly capable of. Much of Klaus's feelings of being useless stem from his father's lowly opinion of him. Although Klaus was an official member of the Umbrella Academy and went on missions with them, he did not contribute much during them. As an adolescent, he had barely tapped into the potential of his powers and at most could commune with the dead. And even that was something that frightened him and he did not like doing. This likely led to some of his siblings viewing Klaus as useless during these missions. Being number four, Klaus is smack dab in the middle of the seven siblings, and likely had been raised as the middle child. There is this idea that the middle child is often overlooked or forgotten as the other siblings demand more attention. I think as an effort to not be in the forgotten middle child role, Klaus began acting out as a means of attention seeking. If he couldn't get love and appreciation for his role as a member of the Umbrella Academy, then he would act out and seek affection through humor and childhood rebellion. Want to watch me piss in dad's gas tank? However, I think this attention-seeking behavior made it so that it was even easier for those around him to dismiss him as an unreliable idiot. Klaus's experiences throughout his childhood had a profound effect on him and left him damaged by the time he reached his adulthood. Much of his behavior, especially in season one, can be traced back to the habits that he developed in his youth. I can't talk to the person I love. People still don't take me seriously. I want to be numb again. When we first meet Klaus at the beginning of season one, he is freshly out of rehab only to go by drugs and immediately relapse. He is very clearly an addict, and when it is revealed that his powers are suppressed when he is high, his addiction makes even more sense. It's the dude who just takes a lot of drugs to, to suppress the dead from badgering him. You know, it's the only thing that can temporarily um, uh, kind of suppress his, his ability that's not in control. He essentially takes drugs to silence the the voices in his head, the emotional turmoil. His childhood trauma made him so afraid of his own powers that he's constantly poisoning his body in order to avoid the spirits. They also serve the additional purpose of numbing his emotional pain as a means to hide from all of his insecurities. Since leaving the academy, his life has been nothing more than constantly looking for his next high. 
He is devoid of any and all purpose and is living life day to day. He is a petty criminal and he uses the things that he steals to supply his drug habit. He is completely and utterly lost, seen as a screw up of society and his own family. When he hears about Reginald's death, he returns to the academy looking to see what valuable possessions he can take and pawn off for drug money. Suspecting foul play, Luther asks Klaus to contact their father, something Klaus is apprehensive to do and when he eventually tries, he is unsuccessful. This seemingly adds to his sibling's view of him as a useless screw up. You're useless. Klaus exhibits some narcissistic behavior, but I don't think it comes from a place of self-love, rather self-hatred. When everyone tells you that you are a useless screw-up and is good for nothing, eventually you start acting how they expect you to and self-sabotage, proving them right. What's the plan? Uh, you wait out front. What? Yeah, you're the lookout. The lookout? Do you have gunfire? What? I think Klaus definitely exhibits these behaviors and on some level hates himself because of his own weaknesses and flaws. He does not hesitate inflicting self-harm, as is exemplified in the eyeball office as he fight clubs himself with a snow globe. Also, when he is captured by Hazel and Cha-Cha, he expresses joy and even arousal when he is being physically tortured. From what I've read, enjoying BDSM does not necessarily mean that the person hates themselves, but it can definitely be a factor. I think it is possible that Klaus's enjoyment of being physically tortured is at least linked to his own self-hatred. Throughout the season, he is often dismissed by his siblings when they are deciding how they should proceed in order to stop the apocalypse. They frequently belittle him, calling him useless and often disbelieving the things that he says. They don't believe him when he tells them that he talked with Reginald in the afterlife. He killed himself. I don't have time for your games. Oh, or when he tells them that he can materialize Ben into the land of the living. He was the one who saved Diego's life, not me. You are unbelievable, Klaus. They think he is just making things up as a means for some kind of elaborate joke. Any luck finding your one-eyed man? What's he talking about? That's a matter, it's Klaus. Also, when they try to stop Victor at the end of the season, they tell him to be the lookout, seeing him as incapable of doing anything meaningful. His sibling's response to him is in part of his own making, as on a number of occasions during important conversations, his attention-seeking behavior would resurface and he would make a joke or try and make himself the center of attention. Did I ever tell you guys about the time I waxed my ass with chocolate pudding? <laughs> it was so painful. What are you still doing here? He does these things as a means of asserting his presence to his siblings, in an effort of not being left behind. But this behavior undermines his intentions as it only leads to his siblings being even more dismissive of him. I think all of Klaus's siblings like him, but I think they have little to no respect for him. As Klaus attempts to better himself throughout the season, the lack of faith his siblings have in him makes it difficult for him to grow and he is forced to prove them and his own inner doubts wrong. After Klaus escapes his captivity, he steals a briefcase, thinking that there would be something in it that he could sell. Instead, when he opens it, he is transported to Vietnam in 1968. He is conscripted into the US military by happenstance, and he fights in the Vietnam War. He is exposed to the horrors of war, and probably even died a few times. However, his time in Vietnam wasn't all bad, as Klaus engages in a relationship with a fellow soldier named Dave. Klaus's relationship with Dave is the most significant romantic relationship of his life, as he mentioned earlier in the season that his longest relationship was three weeks, and it only lasted that long because Klaus needed a place to stay. Klaus and Dave fall in love with each other. He experiences love for the first time, uh, and that's something that is profound, especially from this very kind of opulent, isolated, loveless environment that he's had had to grow up in. It's like, what's the most interesting thing you can do with that character who's completely self-serving? Well, f well, make him fall in love and then uh, give him no option but to serve something else, you know, serve something outside of himself. But the romance ends in tragedy when Dave is killed during the war, Klaus holding on to him in his final moments. When Klaus returns to 2019, he is changed from his time in the war and his relationship with Dave. Klaus expresses bouts of anger after returning to the present. He destroys the briefcase and picks a fight at a veteran's bar. He has PTSD symptoms from the war, and he is now not only trying to block out the spirits, but the memories of his time in Vietnam. He is devastated by the loss of Dave and sinks back into his old habits of alcohol and drugs to cope with his pain. I also think Klaus feels really alone during this time, as his experience in the war is invalidated by the veterans in the bar due to its sheer unbelievability. His first instinct is to close himself in, and only shares his loss when Diego notices that something is wrong and confronts him about it. Klaus finally has adequate motivation to get clean and uses powers as he desperately wants to talk to Dave again. In the day that
that never was, he has Diego tie him to a chair, removing his ability to give in to temptation. He is successful in summoning Dave, only for that day to be undone when Five steals a briefcase and changes the timeline. I think Klaus' sexuality helps show what a well-written character he is. You know, Klaus's sexual preference is, you might say, he's omnivorous. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's, he's a bit like, you know, if it's, if it's above the age of consent and has a heartbeat, let's party. Oftentimes, LGBT characters in media can be reduced entirely to that one trait. Close to such an interesting and compelling character that his sexuality is part of who he is, but it does not entirely define his character. The multifaceted nature of his character makes him a positive depiction of an LGBT person. Critical to Close's growth throughout the season is his relationship with Ben. Ben serves as the angel on Close's shoulder, encouraging him to get clean and to faces demons. He sees Klaus for who he could be if he just started trying, and he does his best to help motivate him to do the right thing in a number of occasions. Having Ben around also makes it so Klaus doesn't have to endure his suffering alone, as like it or not, Ben is always right there with him. But you need to keep trying. Help Luther. You know, I'm tired of seeing you wallow in self-defeat. Well then avert your gaze. You're better than that. His relationship with Ben is one of the things that pulls him out of his downward spiral, as when he is about to take drugs again, he subconsciously manifests Ben's fist into the physical realm, which knocks the drugs out of his mouth. Klaus is so shocked and intrigued by this that he then sets his mind to mastering his newfound skill and using it to help his siblings. I think in the moment that Ben punches Klaus, Klaus realizes that he is capable of so much more and he wants to further his abilities for the first time in his life. When Luther locks Victor in a cell and shows Klaus and Diego, they are both opposed to what Luther has done. I think when Klaus sees Victor locked up in there all alone, he sees himself as a kid locked in the mausoleum. He doesn't want Victor to experience something so terrible and wants to see him freed. And for all we know, she might be struggling with this new power. I mean, it must be scary, terrifying really to discover that you can do something that you never thought you could do. During the climax of the season, Klaus shows how much he has grown, using his newfound powers and manifesting Ben, who deals with the troops sent by the commission. He tries to stop Victor in the apocalypse with his siblings, but when they fail, he goes along with them as they are sent into the past. I think Klaus had a great first season, providing comedic relief while showing that if you look beyond that initial impression, he is an incredibly deep and rich character. I think he is one of the characters that develops the most throughout the season, as he struggles with his addiction and learns to use his powers instead of be consumed by the fear surrounding them. You guys don't want to follow me. I can't lead you anywhere. I'm not a good Guru, I'm not a messiah, I'm, I, I'm a fraud! At the start of Season 2, Klaus arrives in Texas on February 11th, 1960. Save for his ghost brother Ben, he is all alone, with no money, no prospects, and no idea where his other siblings are. He is lost in time and does his best to adapt to his new circumstances. After being tossed out of a diner, he catches the eye of a wealthy old woman and puts his charms and knowledge of the future to great use. Klaus has a very opportunistic nature, and when presented with the opportunity of a place to stay as well as the praise of others, he puts all of his tools to use. Through, I suppose, Ch the charm offensive and being a bit manipulative uh, surrounds himself with kind of adoring you know praising followers. Although he has developed his powers over the course of the first season, he's still very much being carried by Ben. He's able to demonstrate enough magical tricks and knowledge of the future to be worshipped as a prophet. The cult that forms itself around Klaus is key to a season 2 development. Initially, Klaus performs and gains followers out of a need for money, food, and comfort. As the cult grows, Klaus finds himself being praised and worshipped by tons of people, inflating his ego and making him feel needed. Klaus is a character that looks to others for self-validation, and he gets a of it in the form of his cult. Where in 2019, Klaus was seen as a screw up in a waste of space, it felt really good to have so many people applaud him. He feels loved and needed, and even though they do not truly love or know Klaus, he grasps on to this all the same. Where in season one, the drugs serve to numb his pain and fears, in season two, the cult takes their place and help him feel better about himself than he would have otherwise felt. If you're an insecure person who can't be alone with themselves, you know, you either take drugs or you start a cult. And the drugs nearly killed Klaus, so he went on to do a cult instead. So the cult is sort of like a substitute for the drugs to kind of mask the pain that he feels. He drowns himself in their praise, similarly to how he drowned himself in drugs and alcohol as a means of coping with his issues. A number of times throughout the season, Klaus tries to assert that it is not a cult, but rather a community. Cult is a very negative word, Allison. We prefer to call it an alternative 
spiritual community. I think this is because when it was initially forming, Close's intentions were not to create some hive mind, but were as a means to survive and to make the best of the situation that he found himself in. It grew far beyond his imagination and it eventually became too much for him. The praise and worship that had once made Close feel better about himself started to ring hollow as he realized that they loved his persona, not who he truly was. They looked to him as their guide and prophet, putting their lives in his hands, eager to do anything and everything that he told them. This all becomes too much for him to deal with, as he feels like he is being suffocated under the weight of his cult. With so many looking to him for guidance, and where he himself is lost, he can't take the responsibility of all these people, and he flees from them. And I have all these people who have these ridiculously high expectations of me, but I don't want it anymore. And I don't know what I'm doing up here. I, I, I don't, I'm just, you know, making it up. They see him as this all-knowing being, something that Klaus is far from, and he knows this. Their constant praise reminds him that he is a fraud and that he cannot live up to their expectations, just as he was unable to live up to his father's expectations. Well, what's the matter? Don't like what you see? He abandons them in search of something real instead of the falseness that he feels as a prophet. During this time, his relationship with Ben has become contentious. Ben has seen how Klaus took advantage of his situation and all of the people who abandoned their lives to follow him and he is unimpressed by this. Ben serves to remind Klaus how everything he is doing is wrong and refuses to let him do what he wants. With Ben being a constant nagging presence, Klaus feels like he is constantly being criticized and told everything that he does is wrong. Klaus, don't do this. Klaus, do do this, but not like that. <laughs> I mean, I can't take a piss without you nitpicking at my aim. Ben, in a way, is the antithesis of the cult, showing Klaus his real flaws as opposed to the cult that worshipped him and did not see him as being capable of such things. Klaus returns to Texas in order to interact with Dave before he enlists in Vietnam. Klaus is trying to change Dave's tragic future by convincing him not to enlist in the army. He is trying to save Dave's life because he thinks that Dave deserves a long and happy one. Despite being well-intentioned, Klaus's actions only result in Dave enlisting earlier than he did in the original timeline. He puts Dave in a difficult spot as his uncle denounces Klaus and orders Dave to punch him, which the confused and vulnerable Dave does. Feeling he has failed in his mission to save Dave's life and hurting emotionally from the encounter, Klaus falls back into old habits. He sacrifices his sobriety and drowns himself in alcohol, hoping to numb the pain from recent events. With drugs and alcohol being what Klaus used to cope with his trauma his whole life, it is not surprising that he falls off the wagon when confronted with his new pain. After realizing that Victor inadvertently causes the new apocalypse, Klaus alongside Allison and Diego try to stop him. They are unable to reach Victor because of all the power that he is emitting, and so it falls to Ben to save the day. However, in the process of reaching Victor and calming him down, Ben's spirit is destroyed, and he experiences a second kind of death. He leaves Victor with something to tell Klaus. We later learn that upon Ben's initial death in 2006, Klaus urged him not to go into the light and to stay with him. Klaus wanted Ben to stay because he was having a difficult time with losing his brother, and he felt that his power could allow him to keep Ben around. Eventually though, Klaus developed a sense of guilt about this as he felt that he was the reason that Ben never went to heaven. What Ben told Victor was that it wasn't Klaus's fault, but rather that Ben was too scared to move on. I am unsure if Ben's statement is true, or if he was merely saying it to ease Klaus's feelings of guilt. All these years and I thought it was my fault fault that he didn't take his ticket to heaven. <laughs> ben also expressed that his time with Klaus post-mortem meant a lot to him. Klaus also seemingly improved his skills as a lookout, as he is able to spot the Handler and Lila before they attack. After the battle, he returns with his family to the new 2019. I think Klaus had a very interesting season too, with his relationship with Ben and his cult both having a major influence on his development. At the end of the season, he has moved on from serving his own ego with hollow praise and is looking for something more meaningful in his life. Have you ever felt like there's something you're supposed to be doing, something important, but no one's telling you what it is, and you're scared? that you're gonna miss out or, or, or mess it up because you're always screwing things up and you're really fucking tired of it. Throughout season three, Klaus is searching for something more. He is no longer living from day to day and is trying to find meaning in his life, something he feels that he has been missing for some time. He is very self-reflective this season as he realizes that most of his behavior growing up was done in one way or another for others. He would act out as a means of protest against his father and the life he was being forced to live. He realizes that his drugs and the cult were a means of coping with this and that he has been living his life in opposition to the expectations that were placed on him at an early age. So all the drugs and the manipulation and my cult and all of that was a reaction to my father 
and his obscenely high expectations of me. He resolves to live for himself and to find out who he truly is. This journey to self-discovery is explored through his relationship with his birth mother and his adoptive father. The fact that Klaus has no blood relation to Reginald is something that he emphasizes, always making it clear that Reginald is only his adoptive father. It seems like Klaus does this as a means of separating himself from Reginald and all of the things that he put him through. When it comes to his birth mother, Klaus wants to meet her and find out what kind of person she is. He wants to know why she sold him as an infant, wondering if all he was worth to her was $3,000. He also wonders what kind of a person he could have been had he been raised by his mother and how he could have turned out different. He wonders if his life could have been more fulfilling if he had been allowed to be raised by his mother. Despite his desire to meet his mother, he is too scared to do it alone, so he enlists five as emotional support. When he arrives at the Amish community where his mother lived, he finds out that she died before he was ever born. He is also rejected by the community, something that no doubt hurts Klaus. His aunt sees something in him though and tells him that he has his mother's eyes, which Klaus clings to as one of his few connections that he has with his mother. When he learns that all of their mothers were killed before the siblings could be born, he is distressed and wants to get to the bottom of what happened. For him, finding out what happened to their mothers is his main priority, as he feels like his self-actualization lies at the end of that road. Do none yeah. of you heartless bastards care about our murdered mom? Come on! We need to find out who did this! This is the thing! This is the main thing! He sneaks into the Sparrow Academy to confront Reginald about the fates of their mothers. The Reginald that he finds is not the same as his alternate reality father, as this version is being sedated and has been humbled. The two start spending time together, and Klaus helps wean Reginald off the drugs that he is being forced to take. After the two spend more time together, the new Reginald begins to grow fond of Klaus, something that surprises and delights Klaus. Klaus sees the new Reginald as a chance at a fresh start with his father and to finally earn his love and respect. While babysitting Diego's fake son, Klaus is accidentally killed by a harpoon gun. He reawakens in the void where he learns that he has died 56 different times over the years. It is also revealed that when he was a child and locked in the mausoleum, Reginald was killing him and studying how long it took him to reanimate. The amount of times Klaus died and the fact that a number of them were at the hands of his own father is no doubt a traumatic realization and helps explain even more why he would turn to drugs as a method of coping. Unaware that he was dying and coming back to life, the number of death experiences he had definitely had an effect on him. As he experienced enough emotional and physical trauma for countless lifetimes. While he is dead, he is able to have a conversation with his late mother. When he asks who killed her, she tells him that he shouldn't mourn her and that finding out how she died is not what he is after. She tells him that he is searching for a purpose and that he has spent his whole life running away from it. When he returns to the land of the living, he once again meets up with his father. Now completely off the drugs, Reginald wants to thank Klaus for his help by helping him understand who he truly is. Klaus is all about this, but he is unaware of the methods that that Reginald means to take. Reginald shocks him before suffocating him in the trunk of his car. He is fascinated by Klaus's ability to die and come back to life. He wants to train Klaus to use his power better and reanimate in a shorter period of time, helping Klaus explore his powers despite the fear that he feels about them. I suppose really exploring the powers for Klaus is exploring and nurturing his relationship with his father really is that what this is what it comes down to Klaus's training session is presented in the form of a death montage set to cats in the cradles which highlights another aspect of what makes his character so great throughout the seasons Klaus has had a number of really interesting and visually compelling scenes his PTSD rave experience in season one the montage highlighting his rise as a cult leader and his relapse later in the season and his death montage in season three these scenes are always atmospheric and usually backed by some great music Exploring the void with Klaus is also intriguing as there are still so many questions surrounding it and it has a great visual aesthetic. That's what the little girl on the bicycle showed me, but she might be God? She might be the devil? I mean, I don't know. With the void essentially being Klaus's domain, I find that it adds a lot to his character. After seeing a significant increase in his control of his abilities, Klaus is feeling more confident in himself, but Reginald wants to push him even further. He wants Klaus to confront his ultimate fear, and return to the mausoleum that created his fear of his own powers when he was a child. You lost something vital here. It's time you take it back. 
When he first enters the graveyard, he is terrified and being chased by the ghosts, the demons of his past still plaguing him and making him incapable of defeating them. This is when Reginald pulls him aside and tells him how a lot of Close's issues are a result of how Reginald knowingly made him afraid of his powers as a means to better control him. He reveals that Close is afraid of failure and disappointing others, so he has gone through life without trying, without caring, so that he could save himself from the hurt of failure. He confides in him that after witnessing him during the death montage, that Klaus is a warrior and that he believes in him. Show them. Be everything I was afraid to let you become. Klaus takes these words to heart and sees himself for what he could be. He confronts the ghosts and banishes them with his powers. This scene is one of my favorites in the entire season, as it feels like an incredible moment of growth and that Klaus's character arc has been building towards it since the very first season. With Klaus confronting his childhood trauma head on, it really feels like moving forward he is capable of anything. That's the journey he goes on, he's to realize that the, the power that he has is not a terrible traumatic liability it's actually the key to him finding a sense of self-respect you know sense of continuing self-esteem and ultimately peace when reginald and klaus return to hotel obsidian reginald is met with hostility and klaus does his best to bring him into the fold he is told by five and luther that he is being duped by reginald and that he will be betrayed sooner rather than later however after his recent experiences with the new reginald klaus isn't ready to hear this as reginald has helped him overcome his childhood fears and for the first time in his life they have a good relationship klaus backs reginald's plan to go into oblivion only for him to be betrayed last minute as they were crossing over Thinking quickly, Klaus kills himself so that he can go into the void as opposed to ceasing to exist. Once in the void with Luther, Klaus is content to stay put as he does not see there being anything to go back to in the land of the living. The world has been kugelblitzed, and he figures that their other siblings will join them soon enough. It is only after Luther tells Klaus that he believes in him and that he can do anything that Klaus agrees to go back and try and save the others. Luther's belief in him obviously means a lot, and is directly contrasted to how he viewed Klaus in the first season. You are the king of death. Oh, that's a little grandiose. I mean, yeah. I prefer to think of myself as the prince of darkness. Ooh. Well, Klaus, Klaus is sort of, he's more fragile, you know, he's, he's in a constant state of flux and transformation. And that's kind of why, that's what I wanted to, to get round to saying about why I wanted to get on the show, because I was like, Let's do a character who's never the same character for very long. In my opinion, Klaus is the character in the Umbrella Academy that has had the most growth over the course of the series. He has struggled with a lifetime of trauma and turned to a number of vices to help him cope and get through the day. He felt like a screw up and he has gradually done his best to improve himself and confront his fears. He is a flawed character, but he is a character that has a desire to be better than he was, even if the road is not always a straight path. As he has grown, he has searched for purpose and tried to discover what it is that is truly important to him. He brings a a lot to the show in terms of its fun tone, while also showing people that they can be the masters of their own fate and overcome the turmoil that they have had to endure their entire lives. I am captivated every single time that Klaus is on screen, and I always find myself thoroughly engrossed with his character progression. For all of these reasons, Klaus is in my opinion the best character in the Umbrella Academy. If you somehow made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, it would mean a lot if you liked and subscribed. Also, feel free to leave in the comments who you feel the best character in the Umbrella Academy is. I want to thank you for your time and I hope to see you in the next one.